Hello again, my dear friends! For those who missed the previous part, I strongly recommend you get familiar with it before watching this episode. But here is a short retell for you. Hideo Kojima was born, grew up, created Metal Gear and flipped the game industry upside down. A couple of years later he released Metal Gear 2 and only consolidated its success. But now we'll talk about probably the most important event in the life of Hideo Kojima. Raito! Kamiro! Action! After the release of Metal Gear 2, Solid Snake was thrown away for quite a long time. Instead of that, Kojima, with his own hands, ports Snatcher to PC and calls it Snatcher City Romantic. Thanks to a new format and platform, they managed to sound up all characters, make a higher quality of MIDI music, create the graphics and add a brand new act. In 1994, Police Knots is released, which is the blending of two words, police and astronauts. Even from this name, we may assume that this game is about police of the future. Some fans claim that this game is an ideologic air of Snatcher. This game, well, if you can call it a game, outstands with its high detailed sci-fi world, focuses on psychology and other features of Kojima's storytelling. But the age rating was high not because of that, but because of blood, killings and even some sexual overtones. In 1994, another grand event happened, the release of PlayStation console. In 1995, Hideo Kojima gets the console and the following year, Police Knots and Snatcher are released on this platform as well. Meanwhile, Kojima decides to revive Metal Gear franchise, because powers of PlayStation allowed him to create what he always wanted to do, create a game in 3D like in the movie. And he managed to do it. On the famous Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3, in 1997, a teaser trailer was shown to public. This teaser reminds the effect of an explosion. Outstanding graphics, staging, music, all in all the magic of game production and flesh. After a year of intensive development in September 1998, this game was released in Japan and the game was being sold almost instantly. The same situation repeats itself after the release in North America in October and Europe in November. All game magazines and journalists confer this game as game of the year pointing out phenomenal graphics, extremely detailed artists and harmonic music. I should point out that all cutscenes were made using the engine of the game. Kojima was, and still is, against pre-rendered cutscenes and games. According to Hideo, such things only distract players from the natural flow of game process. This way or another, after the release, this game turned into a cult, and even now is considered one of the best games on PS1 platform, and the best game in the franchise. Of course, it may look funny to look at these shaken heads and pixels, and although I had PS1 console and enjoyed games of those times, it's hard to play them present days. Nevertheless, I noticed that after some time of playing, the graphics doesn't bother me anymore. The brain adds all necessary details because of the voices of the characters, their motivations and behavior. Unlike Metal Gear 2, where in comparison with the first part only the plot became better, Metal Gear Solid was more like the Metal Gear of a new generation. Every detail in this game received significant improvements. The basics of the game is the same. We run from one room to another, trying to avoid contacts with enemies. Some aspects, though, have evolved. For example, all Kata conversations were voice covered, and the amount of those conversations was increased. If you need to, contact me by codec. The frequency is 140.85. When you want to use the codec, push the select button. When we need to contact you, the codec will beep. When you hear that noise, press the select button. 
The codex receiver directly stimulates the small bones of your ear. No one but you will be able to hear it. At almost any moment a player could contact his support team and get some valuable information, advice or something abstract. Mei Ling, for example, could tell us and interpret Chinese proverbs and sayings after saving. And in the walkthrough she didn't ever repeat herself. I would like to point out one voice actor, David Hayter, who gave his voice to Solid Snake. How could he know that this project would bring him popularity and dozens of rewards for his voice works of Snake? He sounded as Snake in all complete games, and even some games for mobile platforms. Kojima, in order to make his game more authentic, even asked military forces for help, in order to make soldiers in the game behave as realistic as possible. Along with it, there was a separate group of people who was responsible for the armory. For example, Haydn D helicopter that is seen in the game several times is a bit reconstructed Mi-24 made in Soviet era. Even the name is not quite made up. Hind is the official name used by NATO for this helicopter. The radar improved as well, besides pointing out the locations of the enemies in the area, now it is possible to see the area of vision of the enemies. Enemies themselves became smarter, they have sharper eyes, ears and even are able to track down the footsteps. Playing hide and seek in this part is really interesting. Melee attacks improved as well, Snake learned to throw enemies, strangle them until they pass out. Boxes can still be found on the levels, and their functionality is almost the same, but with one great feature. The game itself can be divided in three big locations, and there are three types of boxes as well. So if Snake needs a fast travel, all he has to do is to get into the car and hide himself with the necessary box. After some time, people will think that the box should be delivered to the place according to the type of the box. He can call it fast travel on PlayStation 1. All in all, MGS inherited a great amount of gadgets, binoculars, remotely controlled rockets, gas masks and body armor. Nevertheless, there were some new gadgets and some of them changed their look because the game was in 3D. The only inconveniences were the controls and camera. Although I can find an excuse for the controls, it's simply rather hard to sum up all the abilities and place them on the limited buttons of a gamepad. And camera, just like in many other games of that time, like Resident Evil or Silent Hill for example, was fixed and could show not the most appropriate angles, if you ask me. Think of it this way, every location had its own camera that followed Snake, and Kanjima sometimes to make an accent or something, or on the contrary, hide something, could create a total indecency with it. But in comparison with the whole gameplay experience, these are just simple flaws. And again, the camera was still better than in Resident Evil games or Silent Hill. Well, if you ask me. The maid upgrade turned out to be the plot and it's finally time to talk about it. The beginning was quite simple, year 2005. The game tells us about a nuclear waste disposal base called Shadow Moses, which is situated on the island with the same name somewhere in Alaska. One day this base was taken by members of genetically modified unit under control of members of Foxhound, Revolver Ocelot, Decoy Octopus, Sniper Wolf, Vulcan Raven, Psycho Mantis and Liquid Snake. Besides they keep the president of arms tech Kenneth Baker and chief of DARPA Donald Anderson as hostages. DARPA stands for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. By the way, arms tech and DARPA are organizations that exist in real world. Anyway, these people capture the island and say that they don't want to be a part of Foxhound squad anymore. Also, they want to take the remains of Big Boss, otherwise they will strike some random place with nuclear weapon. Luckily for us, Solid Snake is not far from that place, trying to find peace in his own mind. Taking into account current circumstances, Colonel Roy Campbell, who is in charge of the squad, contacts Snake and persuades him to release the hostages and save the world. Not without resistance, Snake agrees and pulls off the job. The process of negotiations is shown in the briefing video sequences, where Solid Snake still has long hair and the colonel along with Naomi Hunter, a resident medical officer, describe what's been happening on Shadow Moses. After sneaking into the facility, Snake discovers Donald Anderson, who reveals to us that the whole complex is just a cover-up for the production of a new Metal Gear. Also, he tells us how to stop this death machine and where this thing is, but suddenly Donald dies from heart attack. Snake leaves the cell and faces Meryl Silverberg. She is a nephew of Colonel Campbell and after a brief talk they go separate ways. The next one on the list is Kenneth Baker. When Snake finds him, he's, well, let's say he's not in the best condition, in company with Revolver Ocelot. You're the arms tech president, Kenneth Baker, right? <sighs> Don't worry, I'm here to save you. Ha! <sighs> 
After a short firefight, something strange happens. Right from nowhere, the Cyber Ninja appears, cuts off Ocelot's hand and disappears. In the further talk with Baker, he confirms that the facility is not a place for nuclear waste processing, but a cover for Metal Gear Rex that is very dangerous. At this point, an interesting thing happens. According to the plot, we need to talk to Meryl. What frequency was she at? Oh yeah, let me tell you, it's... Oh, oh. sorry, I forgot. Damn! Oh, that's right. It should be on the back of the CD case. Try to contact her. Got it. Such a thing in playwriting is called breaking of the fourth wall. In this case, to break the wall between the player and the events that are happening on the screen. Such a feature could be found in previous parts of Metal Gear. And the most vivid example of such a feature can be called Deadpool. But this exact moment is extremely vivid and impressive. Such moves became sort of the thing of the whole series that will be shown in future not once and not twice. But just like Donald Anderson, he dies from heart attack. What? What did you do to me? Oh, no! Oh, oh no, it can't be! Those Pentagon bastards! So, they, they actually went in, did it! What are you talking about? They, they, they're just using you for... Oh, oh. Snake suspects that this can't be a coincidence. We found Meryl's frequency and learned some new information, including that one of the developers in Metal Gear, Hal Emmerich, is still alive, and Armstack, along with DARPA, have been working on the Metal Gear for a long time. Members of Foxhound, with their gene-modified members, entered Shadow Moses without a fight because their mission was to provide safety for the test of Metal Gear. Snake decides to find Hal Emmerich and encounters Vulcan Raven, a muscled shaman guy with ravens flying around him. After defeating him, Snake finds Emmerich. And again, some strange things happen. Someone is killing all people around, clearly invisible and cruel. After reaching one of the offices, Snake realizes that this someone is that cyber ninja from before. They fight with each other, but Ninja decides to run away and disappears. Snake realizes that this ninja is none other than Grey Fox from Outer Heaven, who fought with Snake in Zanzibar Land. According to Naomi, his body was rescued from the ruins, but only to be a vessel for experimental drugs and put on that exoskeleton. Members of Foxhound had been performing experiments on him for four years in order to find the most efficient ways to improve experiments with genes. And all those modified soldiers are the result of those experiments. And the most important thing is that Grey Fox completely lost his personality and mind. The last thing he remembers is that fight with Snake on the minefield. That's why he's so obsessed with Snake. He wants him to make Fox real at least something, even pain. Hal is saved and he shares with us much more valuable information. It turns out that this new Metal Gear is not just a copy of the previous one. This one is a new generation and it's more efficient in many ways. The main difference is that it uses magnets to fire a nuclear weapon. In other words, in stealth mode, because in this mode those rockets don't leave a heat trail and cannot be detected. Also he says how to cancel the launch. Hal asks us to call him Otagon and says that he loves anime. After some short sequences and talk with Meryl, Snake will meet him, Psycho Mantis. He is a part of Foxhound squad and specializes on mind control and telekinesis. The fight with him is a complete mindfuck in terms of game design, because this villain completely destroys the fourth wall. And I can't find an example what villain can do such a thing up until even nowadays. First of all, before the fight he says, Let me read your mind. No, perhaps I should say your past. The truth is, he reads the saves on your memory card and analyzes the information he finds there. He can say that a player saves the game too many times or doesn't do that. Also, he can mention what games from Konami you've played. But the most interesting things are yet to come. You still don't believe me? I will show you my psychokinetic power. Put your controller on the floor. Put it down as flat as you can. That's good. Now I will move your controller by the power of my will alone. And the gamepad actually moves. Well, actually it just vibrates and moves on the floor, but nevertheless. Besides, in order to fight him, you have to use your second controller. Or, if you have only one controller, switch it from one port to another. And he likes to shut down the picture, leaving the word Hideo. 
I think it's enough to say that Psychomantis merited his own article in Guinness Book in 2008 for the most innovative usage of a controller. After the fight, the Mantis will tell Snake his story. The story of a boy who found a gift to read people's minds, who found only violence, hatred, pain and suffering there. He was hatred by his own father because he blamed Mantis for the death of his wife, because she died while giving birth to the child. I guess that was the main basis for the further growth and hatred of humanity. So the only good deed he does right before his death, he opens a secret passage. In turn, he asks Snake to return his mask that covers him from thoughts of other people, so he could die in the privacy of his own mind. My mask, put it back on. Okay. Like this, other people's thoughts force their way into my mind before I die. You want to be by myself. If you want to find your future, go through that door. That's one of the reasons why people praise Kojima. He created even villains you could empathize with. You don't feel happy because of their death, like in many other games. Psycho Mantis remains one of the most extraordinary villains in game industry, but even more dangerous enemies already waiting for us. Almost instantly after Psycho Mantis, Meryl gets shot by a sniper. Meryl, get down! Ah! Meryl! She was shot by Sniper Wolf. Snake has to leave his bleeding partner in order to get to the armory and get a sniper rifle. When he comes back, he doesn't find Meryl. Besides, after a short firefight, he gets captured. And here we are able to hear one of the most famous phrases of this beautiful killer. I am Sniper Wolf, and I always kill what I aim at. For the first time, Solid Snake meets Liquid, who calls him brother for some reason. And the only thing that matters we find out from this conversation Meryl is still alive, and this is the place where your actions will influence the life of Meryl. If you make it through the torture, Meryl will stay alive. But if not, well, not really. Should I say that it's pretty hard to endure this torture? Happily, only your fingers may hurt, unlike Snake. In breaks between tortures, Snake is able to talk to the colonel, find the misened corpse of Donald Anderson, and meet a funny guard. We could actually see him while meeting Meryl for the first time. But not all people know that this exact character will be met by Snake in the fourth part, under the name of Akiba, and he will play not the most useless role in the plot. During the tortures we find out that Ocelot is from Russia, and he is into the mission... <sighs> to make Russia great again. With help of Otacon and his invisibility cloak, Snake manages to escape and continue his mission. After some not really important dialogue, Snake runs up to the roof and destroys the helicopter high and deep with liquid in it. But after coming down, Snake meets Sniper Wolf again. After the fight, this woman tells Snake and crying Otacon her story. He tells us that she's one of the Kurdish people. The Kurds is an ethnic group that lives mostly in the areas of middle, north Zagros and upstream of Tigris and Euphrates. They have a very complicated history, but the only important thing for us is that since 1840, they've been fighting for their independence, taking into account that they don't actually have their own country. She's lived in war all her life in fear that this very day can become the last one. All governments don't care about this conflict, and then she found Big Boss, who took her to Foxhound, where she became a sniper. And she decided to take part in this mission not because she wanted to destroy the world with nuclear weapon but because she wanted answers. Answers from the world that took Big Boss away from her. From now on, we start our way to Metal Gear Rex, the final way to stop the launch. Suddenly, Master Miller, our helper in terms of flora and fauna of Alaska, reports that apparently Naomi Hunter is not Naomi Hunter. Snake meets Vulcan Raven, who is not in a tank this time, but holds a huge machine gun. Before death, he will tell us some words about honor and what it means to be a warrior. Also, he will hint us that Donald Anderson, chief of DARPA, could be someone else, because Decoy Octopus, master of disguise, is so meticulous, he even copies the blood of his victims. Later, the truth about Naomi reveals. She's not the person she claims to be, and Snake is a carrier of a unique virus, fox dye, that affects people only with specific genes. Specifically speaking, foxhound members and headquarters of Armstech. Naomi confesses and tries to explain why she poisoned Snake with this virus, tells us about the relationship with Frank Yeager, better known as Grey Fox, how he found her, took care of her, told her about the world, about her hatred to people who didn't allow him to just die and put him into that cyber costume, about all those tortures and experimental drugs, 
The only desire of Naomi was revenge, but there she claims that the virus was a part of the program right from the start, and she put some her own modifications in this virus. After reaching Metal Gear, Snake learns the temperature secret of Digital Palki, that Snake found earlier, and that can put an end to this. And while he's running around, the plot is being revealed more and more. Turns out that Pentagon wanted to kill everyone on Shadow Moses with Fox Die virus in Snake's body, just to pretend like nothing happened on that island. Master Miller, who's been helping us through our journey, turns out to be Liquid Snake. And Solid Snake, guided by Liquid's instructions, enters final codes in order to launch the rockets. Pal code number three, confirmed. Pal code entry complete. Detonation code activated. No. Then an incredibly long monologue is being told by Liquid. He says that they are not just brothers, but clones of Big Boss. And all those hints of Big Boss to Snake saying that he's his father don't look so crazy right now. They are the result of a project called Terrible Children. Only two children out of eight survived. One with all dominant genes, Solid Snake, and another one with all recessive genes, Liquid Snake. And Big Boss always held Solid as an example for Liquid. As a result, Liquid had an awful inferiority complex, so he decided to show the world what he's made of. In the end, the fight with a huge walking machine. In the culmination, Grey Fox enters the scene, saves Solid's life, but dies. Hurry! Get away! Grey Fox, the name from long ago. After destroying Metal Gear, Solid has to fight with Liquid. The final fight. Brothers have to fight each other. Again, Solid manages to win and escapes the island. But even now, Liquid catches up. He's about to kill Solid, but dies from Fox Die. Snake! And after the title, some unexpected facts reveal. Voice that clearly belongs to Ocelot reports that everything's been not quite the way they expected. First of all, Liquid had dominant genes, not Solid. Second, there were actually three survived clones. And clearly, Ocelot works on the third one, with the name Solidus. And specifically for him, Ocelot stole information about Metal Gear and its tests. And last but not least, Solidus is a president. Well, there you have it, a very short retell of the plot of Metal Gear Solid. I haven't mentioned dozens of small details and technical aspects, which may not influence the plot, but make you surprise and think deeper. And I think now you have the idea why this game is praised so much. One more moment can prove this fact. Hideo Kojima didn't just invent a new world, he managed to merge our real world and the world of MGS. We could find mentions about John Edgar Hoover, who was an American detective and the first director of FBI, convention about nuclear disarmament and many other things. Take the Kurds again, who really exist in real life, for example. Just like in many Japanese games and movies, there were some jokes to diffuse tension in the game. Don't move! Snake, be careful. There are Claymore mines around there. Use a mind detector. Who are you? Just call me Deep Throat. How did you recognize me in disguise? I never forget a lady. So there's something you like about me, huh? Yeah, you've got a great butt. Oh, I see. First it's my eyes, now it's my butt. What's next? If you finish the game twice with different endings, Snake will wear a suit just like James Bond, and Grey Fox will wear a red exoskeleton instead of grey. Original game was sold in quantity of 6 million copies. And please keep in mind that this game was an exclusive for PS1 in early 2000s. At least at first. And this is an extremely good result. Unlike MS6, PS1 was the platform that was acclaimed in the whole world. So platform didn't need to try too hard to keep the interest. Nevertheless, in 1999, Metal Gear Solid Integral was released. The game with some bonuses, such as like bonus materials, some new game modes, 
and some minor additions to the game, for example Grey Fox, or better say Red Fox could be found only in Integral. Also here the second disc with virtual missions appeared that could be used for self-training. This disc could be bought separately in Europe by the way. In 2000 the game was ported to PC and it was exactly this integral version. Let's jump to 2004 when the game with the help of Silicon Knights was ported to Nintendo GameCube. The game used the engine of Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty that was already released on PS2. It was almost the exact copy of the original game but with better graphics and new voice covers of all dialogues. Nevertheless a lot of fans didn't like this game due to some reasons. First of all, new cutscenes. Certainly they had to be recreated because of the new engine. In order to do that, a movie director was invited. His name was Ryuei Kitamuro, and he created every scripted scene into slow-mo with bullet traces and acrobatics, which made the game look more like Matrix than Metal Gear Solid. In the original game players could feel realism. Ninja behaved like ninja, a huge bodybuilder with a gun was a huge bodybuilder with a gun, and Snake was a warrior, not some kind of shinobi with all that acrobatics and bullet invasion. The game lost its realism and the dramatic part along with it. Because it's hard to sympathize to someone that ain't real. But still some sequences were truly gorgeous. Besides, the game used a lot of tricks and gadgets from the second MGS, so it was simply unbalanced, I guess. At the last thing that players didn't like very much was controls. Even on PS1 it was sometimes really hard to control the character, and on GameCube it became even worse in some cases. But still this was a decent product that allowed new gamers get familiar with this franchise, and all gamers look at this game at a different angle. In 2007 MGS turned into Interactive Comic Book on PSP. But there is not much to say, cause Interactive Comic Book is an Interactive Comic Book. I should only mention that there was the original comic book that consisted of 12 issues and was released one year before. And this version for PSP was based on the original comic books. Now we've come to the analysis of this game. I have to repeat this again, this episode is just a small part of everything that can be said about this game. But people should understand that a good creation, whether it's a movie, book, video game or something else, should contain some idea, something that a creator wanted to tell. So what did Kojima want to tell people through this game? Luckily every MGS game has a theme or themes you can put in several words. And for this game this word would be genes. The discussion about genes pierces the plot of the game several times. What genes do we inherit from our parents? Is it enough to give someone your gene code to say for sure what kind of person he or she will become? What's the price for blood bonds and spiritual bonds? Is it possible to read one's fate in his or her DNA? Why did Solid win over Liquid if the last one had dominant genes? Why did friend Yeager remember only the last fight with Snake, although he had a lot of other stories to tell? Why did he save Solid? And do these gene-modified soldiers worth those efforts and money to create them? Are they really better than people who had horrible but true experience instead of gene therapies? These are only the part of all the questions you encounter in your walkthrough. Another theme that rises here through Hell and Naomi is why do some people decide to become scientists? Naomi who became a professional geneticist became a scientist because she believed that she could decipher her own gene code and find her fate there. And Hal who decided to become a scientist because he simply was afraid of people and wanted to build robots. There is a very meaningful moment in this game where Hal finds out that Metal Gear is a nuclear weapon and remembers that his grandfather was working on Manhattan Project 
and his dad was born on the 6th of August in 1945, the day a bomb was dropped onto Hiroshima. Such an unwanted inheritance he has. Again, the theme and problem of nuclear weapon is also very well described, because for Japanese people this theme is a very sour subject. Also, the theme of military men and their experience on the battlefield is touched, because all those soldiers of new generation are just people with modified genes, who had experience only in virtual reality, not in real world. Questions like, what can people do to other people? The stories of Psycho Mantis and Sniper Wolf demonstrate this question vividly. Of course, someone can say that all these questions and drama are plucked from the air, but hear what I can tell you. Play this game yourself. Yes, it's rather old, but believe me, the story and atmosphere devours you completely. In order to feel all this, you have to play it, to listen to the characters in the game, what they say and how they say it. You mustn't allow yourself to be chained to fate, to be ruled by your genes. Humans can choose the type of life they want to live. The important thing is that you choose life. And then live. So it was Metal Gear Solid, one of the most straightforward and definitive games in this franchise. Doubtless revolution in terms of the plot, gameplay, graphics, game design and many other things. This is one of the games you can analyze and analyze a lot. The next episode will be dedicated to Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty and its most complicated and twisted plot in the franchise, maybe even in the whole game industry actually. But we'll talk about it in several weeks.